I'm John Goldsmith, and I'd like to talk about autosegmental phonology, uh, primarily as I proposed it in my 1976 dissertation. But also towards the end, uh, I'd like to talk about some of the developments that I talk about in a book I published in 1990 called Autosegmental and Metrical Phonology. And the 1976 proposal um, had two sets of ideas that uh, it, it championed. And um, one has to do with phonological representation, and the second has to do with um, the notions of constraint and wealth formedness and how those notions interact with rule application. It's the first of these two sets of ideas which are, I think, more associated with the notion of autosegmental phonology. But in fact, it's the second which ultimately had a bigger impact on the way we think about phonology, it seems to me, in any event. We'll, we can discuss this. As, as we go along. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, first, let's take a look at the notions of um, the geometry of phonological representation. So there were four principal notions in this regard that, um, that I made in, in my dissertation. The first is that phonological representations consist of parallel tiers of linearly organized segments. So this is a notion that basically you might say flew in the face of the assumptions of most, not all, but most phonological theorists in the preceding decades, if, if not centuries. The assumption has been widely made, you can see it in Saussure even, who says it very clearly, that phonological representations are linear sequences of segments. Um, that's central to our uh, alphabetic notion of language description, of language representation. Um, that's the first idea. The second is that parallel tiers of segments are, are organized by association lines. Association lines are therefore an, a very important part of the theory as such and a very important part of the representation. The third principle um, puts the, makes explicit the importance of association lines because the um, proposal is made that a phonological rule is much simpler if it adds or deletes association lines. Those such statements of addition or, or deletion of association lines are much less costly than the alternatives in phonology, which is a, a insertion of a segment, deletion of a segment, or changing the feature of a segment. So the proposal here was made very much in the context of what I'd call classical generative grammar, which is Chomsky's conception of generative grammar that stretched from logical structure of linguistic theory in the mid-90s, 1955, up until around 1979, when he proposed principles and parameters, which basically abandoned the interest in evaluation metrics. So the work here is done within the context of a theory of generative phonology that um, employs evaluation metrics. So the theory says that we need to specify the cost, so to speak, the complexity of any rule that's part of a grammar and the cost of adding or deleting association lines is orders of magnitude less than that of uh, inserting, deleting a segment or changing a, 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 featural se a featural value of a phonological segment. That's the third principle. The fourth is sort of a meta principle and that is that the study of tone systems um, will be, for the foreseeable future, the richest area in which to discover properties and characteristics of autosegmental phonology. The second aspect that um, I explored in my dissertation, as I say, concerns uh, constraints, wealth form and condition, and how, that, how this relates to um, the, the topic of, of phonological rules. Um, so the first proposal basically was that wealth form of a phonological representation is an important question, and it's distinct from the set of rules in a language. I think it's fair to say that that was um, an innovative notion in the context of generative phonology. Um, there really wasn't such a thing as a notion of well formedness or phonological well formedness. Um, there was exploration about uh, questions about um, uh, morpheme structure conditions. Um, but that in, indeed had to do with exactly that, morphemes and morphophonemic constraints. Um, 
so um, the notion of wealth formation is all, another thing that's very important about that is that it's not an all or none thing that there are relative levels of how well formed a representation is. Right. The second point then was that the geometry of phonological representations is important for understanding what constitutes a well-formed phonological representation. So, again, the, the notion of geometry of phonological representation hadn't played a role up to now, so this was, this was something new. Um, in the case of tone, which is what I looked at most carefully, the well-formedness condition essentially required association lines for certain subsets of auto segments. So an auto segment is a segment on one tier or another, that is to say it's a segment. Um, and in the study of tone, uh, what, what I observed was that all tones were associated with at least one vowel, and all vowels were associated with at least one tone. And so I expressed that as a well formulaic condition, which could be satisfied completely or not completely. There could be a, a, a degree of uh, respect for that condition or of failure to respect that condition. And then fourth, the fourth point was that phonology in, in some respects is goal-oriented in the sense that, well, the metaphor here in my mind was chemistry, that we, we put two or three, whatever, atoms together to form a molecule, there'll be some restructuring, and typically the restructuring has to do with the orbitals of electrons, and the, the electrons will potentially shift um, the allegiance that they have from one um, atom to another. Um, and uh, the phonological equivalent to this is the association lines that um, may associate a vowel or a tone to something else on, on the other tier. And the primary change that we see is that the system will add or delete a minimal number of association lines in order to maximally satisfy the well formedness condition. So these were the central ideas using phonological geometry and um, the numerical counting of how many times and places a violation of the well formedness condition is found. The system will, without any further ado, ado uh, add or delete association lines in order to maximize the respecting of the well formulas condition. Perhaps I didn't make it clear enough a moment ago when I was uh, alluding to the idea that uh, phonological representation in, in some respects has certain goal-oriented behaviors. Um, and I made an allusion to um, what happens when you put atoms together to form a molecule. Um, the, the important thing to bear in mind is that when atoms come together to form a molecule, the electrons reorient themselves and restructure themselves in order to, in, in a certain sense, find a system of lowest lowest energy. And that's exactly what uh, autosegmental phonology is looking for as well. The um, ability to add and delete association lines uh, in order to, in effect, uh, minimize the energy to, to maximize the well formedness. Although I didn't think of it at the time, I certainly wasn't thinking about virtual particles coming into existence and coming out of existence. If I were to be thinking about it today, that's certainly what I would have in mind, the idea of, of virtual particles coming in and out of uh, existence. Okay, I know that all of this would be much clearer with a few examples. We'll get to those examples. But I'd like to uh, go first through the arguments that I gave for treating tone and a certain set of allied phenomena in this autosegmental way, and then we'll get to some concrete examples. There were uh, six arguments principally for autosegmental representation uh, back in the 1970s. One of them, the one that I'll um, bring in here as argument five, wasn't entirely explicit at that point. Um, it, it was it there, but not. it was lurking a bit. It was not one of the f actually five arguments that I um, offered in the dissertation. Okay, so the, the six arguments essentially this. First of all, that there are contour specified features, by which I mean we can find vowels that are associated with two, or in fact in some cases three vowels, in a row. 
so that um, there is no way to say that, the, let's suppose it was a low and a high. There's no way to say that the vowel is low or is high. It's rather the sequence of them, of low and then high, but segments themselves don't have an internal structure. They are atomic, as atomic as anything can be. Um, and so we need to both respect the atomicity and the homogeneity of the vowel on the one hand, and also respect the sequentiality of the tone specifications on the other. So that's the first argument. Autosegmental phonology allows you to do exactly that. The second uh, argument uh, derives from the discovery that there is such a thing as floating tones. And this is something that some of the um, European Bantuists like uh, Mersen and Forhuva had done a great deal of work on. Um, and they clearly established that there were morphemes in Bantu languages that were solely tones. They were tones and nothing but. And, and so the, the term um, arose out of these people's work, um, the, the notion of a floating tone arose. So in autosegmental terms, this is a very natural thing to find. It's a segment that's on the tonal tier and nothing but that. The third argument uh, is the argument from stability. And, and here, this is um, a, an observation that um, I, I attribute to several people. Uh, Paul Kiparski, who was one of my teachers at the time, who uh, drew my attention to work by Julie Lovins and, um, and Chuck Kisseberth uh, back in the early 1970s. In the context of autosomatal phonology, the, the, the point was this, that we find over and over in African tone languages that if there's a, um, a synchronic rule that deletes a vowel, and we have structural reasons to associate um, a tone with that vowel, a particular tone with that particular vowel. If and when that tone is deleted, the sorry, if and when that vowel is deleted due to some other phonological process, like for example, if we've got a sequence of two vowels at, at a word boundary, let's say the, the one on the left tilde, it's a very common rule throughout African uh, language phonologies, in fact, more, more generally. Um, when we are in the presence of a, of a, a rule or a set of processes like that, the tone associated with the vowel that deletes doesn't disappear. And typically, rather, it uh, reappears or it appears on the vowel that's left behind that isn't deleted. Okay, um, the fourth argument um, is directly connected to the way I described the well formedness condition. And that is this, we find in tone languages very often a phenomenon whereby um, the tone that we logically associate with a particular morpheme spreads either to the left or to the right in an unbounded fashion up to the point, up to but not including, the next vowel that's associated with a tone. So we can see this kind of expansion of a tonal domain up to but not including the next specified, tonally specified vowel. We can see that as an opportunity uh, that is offered, so to speak, to the representation. And what it means is that the vowels that were not associated with any, with any tone um, become associated with a tone. You can see that I'm thinking in a very process-oriented way, a kind of a superior sound pattern of English view of phonological rules. Um, the fifth argument, this is the one that I said was implicit in, in this earlier work, is that the notion of locality is modified to, due to geometry. So phonologists have a very strong uh, sense that most phenomena in phonology are local. That is to say, it's much more common for there to be a phonological uh, process or constraint that um, involves two adjacent segments than it is to find such processes that involve segments at a distance. And with autosegmental phonology, we have to think more, more carefully about what it means for two segments to be adjacent. Because if we've got two segments on, let's say, a tonal tier, we've got two, sorry, if we've got two tones on a tonal tier, um, they may be associated with vowels that are 
themselves not adjacent, perhaps not even um, on adjacent uh, syllables. In that case, the two tones on the tonal tier may still be adjacent. So the, um, the intuition that uh, auto segments are adjacent or not, when we adopt an autosegmental representation, it's different than the intuition that we had of uh, the, our understanding as linguists when we thought that there was just one row, one string of segments, and there the notion of adjacency was really quite simple. You could just determine whether the two segments we're talking about were literally adjacent. In the context of autosegmental representation, that's no longer the case. The tones can, tones can be adjacent without the vowels to which they associate being adjacent. Um, and finally, um, autosegmental representation clarified the sense in which tones can have a morphological character. It's not the case in general when we look at languages that I think the phonology and the morphophonology of languages. It's not in general the case that the tonal, that the featural specifications of segments can have morphemic value. That, that, it, that, it, that it can be morphemes. We think of morphemic uh, identification as being associable, logically connected, not associated in our sense here. Uh, we think of the possibility of a, a structural change as being logically associated with a particular morphosyntactic feature. Um, but that's less than what we see in autosegmental cases. It's frequently the case in African tone languages, for example, which are autosegmentalized, that the tones themselves are morphemes. And, and this representation clarifies how and why that can be the case. So these are the arguments. And uh, I'm going to break this video here. And in the next video, part two, I'm going to look through a bunch of clear examples to show you in, in some detail um, why we take the steps that we do in analyzing these languages.